Discover how smarter project insights can lead to better project outcomes. Hello, project people. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Project Chatter podcast. It's always great to have you with us. And if you haven't done so already, please press subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast player or YouTube if you prefer to watch our friendly faces. And don't forget, I say this every time, leave us a rating, comment, debate. Discourse is good. And uh, look, I want to say hello to Dale. Dale, I know you're under the weather a bit. How are you feeling today? I'm not too bad, thanks. Maybe a little bit nasally. But um, if the listeners mm -hmm. can put up with that, then they can put up with most things. So we, we, we've, we've given them a lot to think about the past few pods. So a bit of nasalness from myself, I think, is all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you sound all right to me, mate. Good to have you back. And uh, we welcome our guest today. Uh, we're joined by Richard Logue. How are you, mate? I'm very well, thanks, guys. Be I'm here in North London. Beautiful sunny day today. And uh, yeah, all good. Excellent. I love a winter here. There's good weather in London. Uh, there's good weather in Melbourne too, which is a shocker. It was lovely today too. So we've got bright sun, uh, bright sunshines on both sides of the world. Now let's get into this. I know we want to, there's a lot of things to tackle in this uh, topic and I love the title. Uh, I don't want to ruin it for anyone who's listening straight away, but Richard, uh, tell us how you got into this subject matter and where did it all start from you? The origin story, if you like. Well, I suppose the origin story, guys, is that I'm originally from a place called Donegal in the very far north of Ireland. And I've lived in London since the mid 1980s. And I guess my real passion as a kid growing up was transport, loved railways, loved all that. And I got a job with uh, London Underground in the late 1980s as a computer programmer. But I kind of stumbled into project planning and project management in that I was given a task to start uh, programming in a product called Artemis. And I found out an aptitude for it because it was pretty straightforward stuff. And from there, I got pulled in literally into what was known as the tunnel lighting project uh, back in 1991. Now, if you've ever been stuck on a tube train and you're looking for something to do while you're waiting, have a look at the lights that light the tunnel. That's the project that I was involved with. And that kind of moved on from there into the early stages of planning for the Jubilee line extension. But then I left London Underground in 96 and joined Artemis directly. And I, it wasn't that big a leap because I knew an awful lot of the people in the company at the time. And I was taken on as a business consultant in Artemis. And for the next seven years, I spent my time literally traveling the globe implementing project planning systems with different clients and really kind of getting involved and trying to sort of bust a few myths and really make things practical because that's really I guess what I'm passionate in my work is taking what people conceive to be a difficult problem and making it fairly bite-sized and hand uh, 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 and easy to resolve and so I got a very very privileged in that I got to work with an awful lot of fantastic organizations from ranging from Sasol in South Africa, um, where I spent six weeks, probably one of the happiest six weeks in a project. Uh, they, and they do an amazing piece of work down there. They're planning plant shutdowns and they have in those days, I don't know, um, perhaps they're still doing it, but at that point they had to get their projects ready uh, for a specific day when about several thousand workers would descend on the place to do the plant shutdown. So all mission critical stuff. And then I did some work as well at um, NASA, which was exciting uh, because it was as a small child watching Houston Mission Control on TV it was incredible to sort of actually step in and see that. So that, you know, working with Artemis was probably one of the, you know, a very, very happy experience. I worked with some great people uh, down there, people like Steve Wake, uh, people like John Barnett, who I've worked with still for many years. And yeah, it was a good grounding in how EV works, a good grounding in project controls. So I went freelance um, in 2004 and I got involved with implementing, my first task was to implement, as part of the team, implementing Primavera at uh, the then fledgling network rail. And that was literally ground up. How you, We literally went, walked into the office with a blank sheet of paper. How do we set project controls up? And so we did. And um, they're still using it. And a lot of the processes that we 
implemented as a team are still in use today down at Network Rail as well. And I ended up working then much later on on the Thameslink program, uh, doing putting into practice a lot of what I was preaching. So I'm currently at TFL again, um, working on the um, fleet heavy overhaul project, a slightly different project from the sort of ones I've been working on, but the principles are pretty much still the same in terms of what you record, how you manage, and getting the costs down to manageable levels. So yeah, it's it's um, it's um, it's it's interesting. It's very varied, and uh, along the way, I have met several senior executives and project control managers who all come up with often the same myths about EV and how difficult it's meant to be implemented. And to be honest with you. When I talk to the client and you discover what it is they're actually recording, they're already recording the basic stuff. You know, there's nothing in there that they're not doing. It's just, you know, you'll hear things like, well, we can't do EV because we're not a government project or we can't do EV because it's difficult and expensive and we'll have so many planners to implement things. And we can't do EV because actually our projects are too small. And that, none of that is the case. You know, it's you know, when you actually work it out, you've got a, a forecast of what work you're going to do. You've got cost. You know what the piece of work should cost if it's been costed properly. And then you're simply recording against that. So I would argue that in any project, it's not difficult. And you definitely don't need some special software. I mean, Excel will do it. If you've got the raw information, you can process it. So that was was my experience on that. Yeah, thanks, Richard. And look, just for the listeners that maybe have heard of, I mean, I've heard various, it's like any other methodology, it can be bastardized and, and used in different ways. Definition, I always try and start with a distinction or a definition because it helps the listeners. What's, what's the easiest way to explain or define earned value from your experience? I've often used um, kind of like the example of you've got a wall, you're told you've got to build a wall and you've, you've got, it's going to cost you $100 to build that wall. And that wall has got 10 rows of bricks and you expect that it's going to, you're going to lay one row of bricks every single day over the next 10 days. And it's going to be basically $10 to lay a row of bricks. So the way you, you, you'd set that up as effectively your baseline and then you start the project and you then set up, start laying the bricks. At the end of the first day, you've spent $10 of the $100 budget, and then, but you've only laid half a row, but you still spent $10. At that point, you're behind schedule and you're over on your costs because you, you're gonna have to then take a decision what you're gonna do in order to make that up. So the next day you employ an extra person and try and get and, you, and by the end of day two, you've got, let's say, two rows of bricks done. So you're on, you're now on schedule, but you're still ahead, of, uh, you're still over on your costs. So EV is basically simply recording how that all works. So it's really not difficult. You know you've got a budget. You know how much it's going to cost to actually do a piece of work. And you know how long you need to actually do the, do the work. Mm, no, that's good. I, I love um, you know, something you can visualize as well that helps people understand it. And, you know, I, I, we've all, I guess, Dale and I have both kind of cut our teeth in earned value for a long period of time. And, and I think the defense, defense industry seem to have a very you know, kind of robust and mature way of delivering it. But when you see it outside of that sphere, it, it's somewhat not the same. And I think it's something to do with the way we define maybe the subtopics within. So for example, the perf one, the perfect one I can I can bring up is progress. The debate around progress seems to be the sticking point to earn value in general. Before we get into the myths, I know we will. Yeah. Um, how do you, so progress in general, earn value progress, you can talk about the definition of that. And then this, the follow-up question to that would be, what's the simplified version of capturing progress on projects? And I know it's different for each one, but I'd love to hear your views on that. Well, there's a couple of ways we've looked at progress because Give you the example of Primavera P6. It uses uh, physical percentage complete often as a method of de declaring progress. But oftentimes with physical percentage complete, it's a subjective measure. 
So you can walk up to you know, a planner or a project manager and say, look, what percentage complete is that piece of work? Oh, 95% complete, boss. No problem. And then yeah. two weeks later, you go back to the same person. You say, that project was, that, that piece of work was 95% complete. How's it now? I'll tell you what now, 98% complete now at this stage. Yeah, I think, you know. And you're never going to be complete. It's just going to stay at 99% complete. So you've got to tie in your physical progress into something really tangible. Now, one of the key things that we use, so for instance, on Thameslink, now we use EV, in my view, very successfully on Thameslink. Um, big, big railway infrastructural project, significant rebuilding of stations like London Bridge, adding in um, brand new high-tech signaling systems to allow us to run a train every two minutes down a very congested railway tunnel. And what we did was when we got down to the cost levels and we wanted to measure the progress, we would take the work package, where we'd cost it at the work package level, and we would take specific points which we would agree in advance with the commercial managers and with the project manager to say we want a tangible deliverable within this work package and it is a yes or no it's a binary choice you know is this piece of work done or not and at that point you would advance the percentage complete based on those particular steps so i think the real key is is that you've got to have something tangible and I go back to my example of the row of bricks, you know in your project plan, you've got to have one row of bricks built every day in order to meet your targets. The mistake often people often make is that they, they, they turn that into a subjective measurement and you can't measure value on that. You've got to find something that's tangible. And it's either, in, in certainly in the case of you know, track laying, we said we had to lay at least, and I'm gonna you know, put out a random figure, say 200 meters of track, um, a day. Well, that is a tangible, something you can measure. So it's finding what you can measure. And I go back to the project I'm on at the moment. You know, we say we need to be able to complete an entire train in a week. Have you completed that train in a week? Yes or no. If you haven't, how much more time do you need? So you can say it's either 100% complete or it's 50% complete of what you've actually earned in that value. So I think the key there, Val, is very much to find something that's measurable and clear, that it's not jargonese and it's not uh, something that's you know, difficult to measure. Make it clear and then it makes your life a heck of a lot easier. Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, yeah, it's going to be, we'll come back to it in, in a second, but I want to get into these myths because I think, Richard, there's a few that you want to bust today. So let's, let's kick it off. Uh, let's start with the biggest, the ugliest you can think of, Richard. In terms of myth, myth busting uh, on earned value, what's the biggest one you've encountered? I think the weekend? one I often hear is that our project's too small for earned value. You know, we're not really doing a lot. We, you know, we don't need to do very much. And that's, that's the easiest and the biggest myth to bust. It's the one I hear so much of out there in the industry. Um, at the end of the day, you're doing a project. If that project costs you $100 or if it costs you $10 million, it's still a cost. So you can measure that. You don't need to have any huge complex systems. You just know that I've got to deliver a, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll say, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was at Heathrow Airport, for instance, uh, we would have, um, we did a floor tiling, uh, retiling exercise on the, on the floors in one of the term buildings. Big job because you've got to kind of close off bits of the building. And that, in the terms of what Heathrow Airport spends on, it wouldn't be a huge expense, but it's still something you still want to measure. And I think, and I don't know the exact costs, and you know, it, but let's say for argument's sake, it would have cost the company, you know, fifty thousand pounds to retile a particular set of a, a terminal. For argument's sake, you can measure that very easily. You can see exactly how many square meters. You know how many square meters of tiling you have to purchase and to lay. And then you record it against that. At the same time, they would have been doing, and they did Terminal 2, for instance, which is a fantastic building, several, God knows how much millions of pounds it cost to build that terminal. But again, you know, that's, that's a massive piece of work. But of course, like every other building work, you break it all down into the components and you measure. So if you've got, in any project, if you've got a cost, you can measure it. 
Um, and it doesn't matter about the cost. And, and I think also the other big myth as well is that EV requires a team of planners, a team of commercial managers, a team of surveyors. It's, you're turning it into a cottage industry of planning. Honestly, you can implement EV on Excel. I've done it. Not difficult. As long as you have the key ingredients, which is your cost, your schedule, how much progress you've made in real terms, and when you expect it to do it, it, it can all be done. And I think it's just simply a, me a, a method of measurement. And I think that's one thing that managers have to kind of stop being afraid of, because I think in the past there, there has been, and I, I got involved in one particular client where there was a big army of people. And from a planner's point of view, you are literally getting down to measuring stuff that really you can't measure. Uh, things like on cost. Now that has been the biggest headache out there because if you've got things like fixed costs on your business, like your electricity bill and your headcount and your training budget, the temptation out there would be to try and apply EV techniques. I'd say don't do it. You know what your costs are going to be. And unless you can specifically assign the cost of a resource to a particular project, not worth the effort. You know, it, otherwise, mm -hmm. from a planning point of view, you'll be there till four o'clock in the morning undertaking the work of Satan, trying to sort of get all of these uh, reports done. You know, measure what you, me you can measure, report what you can report on. And I think it makes life, you know, no matter how big the project, it makes life a heck of a lot easier. Yeah, well said. I mean, I think I was always taught anyway, Richard, the same, the same myth. I think any project, it was treated like, it was a defense company I was working for and any, any program over 200 million, they would employ earn value, but anything less than that, they'd say, no, nah, it's too, it's too much overhead. And it was, it was actually like that. I think this is going back a few years now, probably 10, 15 years ago, they would have a full team. Um, and I guess the only other thing you need is a Dave, right, Dale? Um, when you're doing earn value, but I think the, the challenge is, always is do it with Dale. yeah, or a Dale, how do you, how do you simplify it? And, and that, I guess, if you're going to bust the myth and you're going to go storming into your manager's office tomorrow morning on a Monday and say, I heard Richard on a podcast on the weekend and he said this was simple stuff. How do they go about that? What can we do? It's a tricky one to answer, Val. Um, the, what I've done in the past is I've often maintained where I've been on an organization where they've kind of you know, had this big pushback about EV. I've actually maintained my own EV record and just simply taken on the information I've used. I've got a spreadsheet tucked away that I've used just to record stuff. And I will often go back to, mm. and I would suggest you just say, look, I've just done this quietly in my own time over the last few weeks. No, I wasn't up until four o'clock in the morning doing it. I just happened to just pick it up from you know the regular project review meetings. That's your metric. How about we incorporate this into the system? Oh, do we need to put special software? Nope, I've got Excel. Do we need um, an army of planners? No, I just did it for you. Do we need a whole load of cost managers? I did it for you. I got the information the cost manager gave me. You know, mm. most organizations have all of the, you know, the basic building blocks in place. And all I'm saying is that this adds an extra level of depth to your reports without the need to invest billions in expensive consultants and whatnot. Because as I say, what you've just said there, Val, about you know the, the, the perceived notion that it has to be like a $200 million plus project. I still hear that. And I hear that so often that I could almost like, you give me a pound for every time I'd be a millionaire. But, you know, it, <laughs> as I say, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a relatively straightforward technique. It's something that just simply adds that little bit of extra depth to what you're reporting. And the beauty that I like about EV is that before you're, project starts to report delays this is a metric that kind of says hang on a minute buddy you're you've got a problem potentially coming up here and it's something that you know i think that any project of any size is would really benefit from and especially you know when you've got organizations where there's a bit of a culture of fear and we don't want to tell the senior management that the project's going wrong because we'll get sacked I'm very much of the belief that you've got to actually anticipate where there's problems coming up and get them out there before it's too long and too, you know, too late. So good uh, that you've raised so many other questions. I've got a real small one. If, if we're talking just on the guys that are going to take some action based on what we talk about, because some people just listen, right? But others might take action 
Is yep. there any free or you know low cost resources out there? We talked. We're going to talk about education in a second, but yeah, anything out there that would give them the crash course and earn value? Do you know today? what? If you go, you know, it's it, go on Google, and if you Google EV measures, I mean, I went on this call this morning, and there's loads of stuff out there. There's a couple of pages of printouts and things like that that I, you know, you you, you can get. There is. And, and the other thing is, as well, by the way, the U.S. Department of Defense, if you go on the U.S. Uh, DOD website, they have got a full and complete EV manual. It's a big read. And if you're a big nerd, you'll love it. I'm a big nerd. Perfect. Um, I'm, already, I'm Googling it now. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's so much stuff out there that you, you know, for free that you can get. And, you know, it will give you the raw basics. Now, you can go in and get, you know, detailed consultancy and things like that. And there's a lot of excellent practitioners out there who will go in and you know, give you a really, really good um, basis, you know, you know, to do the work. And I would, buy, and I would also highly recommend uh, Steve Wake. Um, he's a former colleague of mine when we were at Artemis. And, I, I'm, and he's also currently a fellow liveryman at uh, the Educators Company here in the city of London. Um, and Steve is a guy, you know, I, I learned a huge amount from him and he's mm. somebody who does come up with some very, very, very powerful and very straightforward messages about these things. Yeah, he's great. We've, we heard him a few times on the pod and yeah, we love having him back. Uh, we just let him talk and he just spills out nuggets of wisdom and you just got to be careful to catch him. Look, I'll, I'll hand over to Dale now because there's so many interesting facets we can take on this own value journey. Dale, over to you. Thanks, Val. Richard, thanks for sharing all of that so far. And yeah, as Val says, there's so much that I've written down already. I love the fact you brought up, you know, that the, the, there is no sort of right size, right, of project. It can be applied anywhere. And your spreadsheet takes me back to also about 10 odd years ago when I was asked to implement EV light. It's like, okay, <laughs> it's, just, it's just earned value, but it's just in a spreadsheet at not as much detail as you want on your larger projects. But okay, EV light. But the same principles apply, right? You have a baseline, you have a measure, exactly. Yep. The other thing I love you brought up is, you know, tied into something tangible. I've also worked on software projects where there isn't necessarily something tangible, but you create, you know, rules of credit. So perhaps your stage gates where you're testing the software, do they pass or not? You, you gain certain amounts of credit. And as yeah. you, you brought up, depending... And, then, and especially in Agile. And Agile, and you know, there's another myth around, oh, you, you're doing an Agile project, so you can't do EV. Yeah. Yeah, you've got it in, in one there, Dale, about the stage gates. I think that's where you've got, again, measurable. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we had certain rules around measurability as well, because... You'd say, right, for example, you, you couldn't have a percent, comp we're getting into the, 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 the nerdy bits now of, you know, earned value types or methods, whatever you yeah. want to call them. And if you zero 100, then that's okay. But as long as, you know, that's within your reporting period, it's okay. So have, you know, your maximum durations would be two weeks, for example, that type of thing. So for those that don't know, zero 100 is you only get credit once you've completed that activity it's a task. binary it's a very much a binary measurement yes exactly the great thing about that it drives delivery because you can make you know 100 starts and you'll have zero progress uh where if you have 100 finishes you'll have 100 you know uh, bits of uh, credit for that um but if you do have a percent complete and it's linked to something you know intangible then you need to come up with those rules of credit which is quite interesting as well so that's my comments on that um and I love, we bring in uh, Dave Pulford, old colleague of ours. Everyone needs a Dave because he was, he was our, our EV guru as well. So big shout out to Dave Pulford on that. I want to bring up another one for you though, Richard, that I've heard is that earned value doesn't suit certain types of contracts. And the one most recently specifically is earned value in NEC three or four, whichever one you're using, they don't match because you have a, you know, the latest accepted program and that's in terms of NEC is your latest baseline. So how can you have two baselines? And my sort of response to that is, well, actually you can have two po points of measure. Yeah. One is a contractual point of measure for commercial perspective. Yeah. And the other one is your original scope and intent and any, you know, changes that, that you make to that. So I um, wonder if you want to add to busting that myth <laughs> around contracts and how earned value, you know, plays nice or doesn't play nice with it. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, uh, I mean, I've been doing a lot of work on Primavera P6 and P6, 
does lend itself to exactly that scenario you've talked about, Dale, in that you can basically have a different view on you know, original contract baseline. I mean, for instance, um, in the railway, we would take a monthly baseline anyway to look at our progress um, on a period by period basis. And that's been the same when I was at Network Rail and then when I was at uh, TFL as well. And you can basically slice and dice your measurements along that. So I would 100% agree with you in the context of an NEC 304 contract. It shouldn't be a barrier at all uh, that, you know, because you know, you've got the ability there to measure some of that. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because the other the one that you mentioned there, but we haven't gone into, and let's get into it, I think, a little bit, is the whole fear factor around earned value. The whole concept that actually it takes an army of people to implement. Um, it, why are people so afraid of it? Other than, so, so those that truly know it can use it to their advantage. And Val and I, when we work together, we always said, use the earned value metrics to drive delivery, not as a reporting mechanism, because then it changes your attitude towards it, right? If you use earned value as, oh shit, this is a stick that, you know, I'm going to use for my, you know, boss to, to smack me with, mm -hmm. then guess what? You, you're going to be a little bit afraid of what it's telling you. And you're going to call it things like academic, right? It's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's just something that, you know, mathematical equations that don't mean anything. But actually, if you look at the data and if you set it up correctly, and if you have a, a, a controls team or individual that understands it correctly, they can actually interpret that information and provide you excellent metrics to be able to make decisions on. And so that brings us into the whole, I guess, psychology, behavior, culture of project delivery. And I wonder in your experience, because you, you, you've worked across very many uh, geographical locations as well as industries, can you kind of bust some of those myths to those that are particularly afraid of it? Yeah, um, because, because as Val says, it's, it is a bit of a dying thing. I haven't seen earned value sort of want to be implemented uh, of late, but how do we show its value to those that are afraid or perhaps don't know how much it can actually provide? So in my experience, Dale, what I found where you have basically effectively a sweatshop of planners grinding out these reports at 4 a.m. in the morning, um, the, mis the biggest mistake that was often made uh, and I will certainly name no names to protect, the, <laughs> to protect people, it was that I mentioned earlier on about trying to monitor on cost to earn value. I think the biggest mistake that organizations have made in the past about trying to implement EV has been that what they end up doing is in the, in, in the search for perfection, they will never achieve it. Uh, and uh, as I say, when you start trying to sort of apportion um, head, you know, sort of business, you know, business overheads and things like that onto uh, onto EV ain't going to work. I think the, the 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 secret is to ensure that when you're measuring EV, you're measuring on tangible work, and you've you know, in terms of the expenses, you know, you're going to have a headcount of people who you're still going to pay their bills at the end of the. Um, period because you know, they, they are you know, effectively an on cost to the business. I think the key is to actually measure against deliverables and where you've got specific work packages set up, avoid the temptation to cost at too granular a level. You know, somebody might say, well, I actually want to see that, you know, we, we bought 50,000 paper clips for this project and we use 22,000. Oh, that's not giving you any value. What does that tell you? You bought a lot of paper clips. What you're really interested in is the thing you're delivering. Are we delivering that to time? Are we delivering it to cost? Do we have any problems coming up front? That's what really matters. And I think if organizations can kind of stick to the knitting and stick to the basics about what they're measuring, you eliminate that need. I mean, I'm sitting there, one person been able to churn out some fairly straightforward EV reports and some of the stuff that we've got. Um, without the need to be there till 4 a.m. in the morning, you know, it's, uh, but I, as I say, you know, you, I've seen it in the past, uh, yeah, where people uh, have tried to sort of get too granular about the cost loadings. And I think really keep it, you know, keep it measurable, keep it fairly straightforward would be my key message. So then if we go down that and peel back the layers on that, you, you, you pro I think you're probably inferring to breakdown structures. 
Yes. So, you know, do we have the work breakdown structures set out correctly? And I think not enough people actually place value in that early, you know, part of setting up the program because, yeah, I, you know, you, you, I've come into projects and I've heard we've all, we all like plumbers or electricians. We come in and go, look at what, look what the jockey before me did, right? But without, without trying to sound too much like that, you know, I've seen work breakdown structures. I go, why have they set it up like this? Because it, it doesn't kind of make delivery sense. No. It's, it was almost just done as a boxing exercise. Yes, we shall have a work uh, breakdown I structure. I was going to jump in there. I know why. <laughs> jump in. Because they, they set up the CBS first. This is the yeah. problem. So you have a bunch of financial people, no offense to financial people on the call, but the cost breakdown structure is built before the work breakdown structure. Yeah. It, it, almost because of the time, right? It, it's a time issue and it's always the case. And then you're aligning the cost breakdown structure back to all the WS, sorry, back to the CBS. And it gets very messy there because obviously yeah, that doesn't look before the, before the horse. That, isn't yeah. It? You know, I yeah. mean, to my mind, um, maybe I'm old school about this, but to my mind, the very first thing you draw up on a project is a work breakdown structure, because you want to understand what it is you're actually been tasked to deliver here. Mm. And the costs, you know, and I go back to, you know, like Thameslink, for instance, the work breakdown structure, you would have, you know, basically a project like uh, building uh, the approaches into London Bridge. The whole project would be at the top, remodel uh, the track layout into London Bridge. Then you're getting down to the next level, which would be is London Bridge is actually in two sections. There's an overhead section and then there's a lower level section. So you can break it down into the tracks leading into both those sections. And then you could break it down into the specific tracks that are actually coming out from different places. And, you, and that to me is, that's your first call on your work breakdown structure. Now the costs, the cost people say, oh, we've got this bucket of cost. Here's your cost breakdown structure, a, a budget of a whole thing. No, WBS should be driving that. And, and in fact, at Thameslink, it did. I mean, you know, it, you know, mm -hmm. it was a great project to work on um, because it trans literally transformed um, a lot of London's railways. It doesn't have the same profile as Crossrail or anything like that, but it's done a huge amount of difference in terms of how um, you know London gets around and it just gets on and does the job in a very quiet way. But yeah, yeah so for the work breakdown structure, um, to me, you do the WBS first and then everything else falls into place. Now there is, of course, you have to tie in an OBS into that, uh, you know, which will help you with your work package generation as well. But you know, putting the costs, you do need to actually focus on what you're delivering first, in my view. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting one because we, like I say, every we, we speak about the various courses out there and certifications you get. Everyone talks about a WBS, but no one actually, I don't think, teaches the application of it. So we all know the theory yeah. of, okay, work breakdown structure, but actually living, breathing, and understanding what makes a good work breakdown structure versus mm. a poor break dance work breakdown structure maybe that's another episode val we need to get someone on to discuss just wbs's and go down that rabbit hole do it but i do want to uh, shift on slightly richard the other one that i've heard about evm is that it's too rigid and it's very slow to react to change and i've got my thoughts on you know change control and and evm and the pmb and all that type of thing um but what, what's your take on that? How do you bust that myth that earned value is too rigid? I think, you know, there's been times when, you know, when you've had to do a re-assessment of some of the costs and whilst you'll have a, you, know, you can keep a historical baseline to show where you originally said, it's, it really is a case of doing change control to say, okay, we're late because this has happened or materials haven't arrived on time or we haven't had... Um, as many people on the job as we wanted, so we've got to check, make a change. I think as part of any project control system, you've got to have a reasonably solid change control system in place, but not so solid that you can't change the project. You know, things happen. I mean, look at the pandemic. Look at the impact that the pandemic has had on projects right across the board. And we have, you know, we're in a situation where we have to be reasonably agile to be able to change things around. So I think the key is that you always have to have a change control process in place. 
And it's not just, oh, let's just change the project. It is about a proper buy-in from stakeholders and getting it done. But does it have to be a very compli complicated, convoluted system? No. As long as you've got all stakeholders engaged. And I think that's the key for a lot of projects is that you know stakeholders have to be engaged on a regular basis anyway. And that's not really to do with EV. That's more to do with the project culture in any organization. So I would just say, look, as long as you've got a change control system that is robust, takes into account realities in terms of what we're faced with on projects, regardless of whether you've got EV or not, you, you know, any project worth its salt has to have a proper formal change control process. It doesn't have to be you know, onerous, but as long as you've got something that actually has got buy-in from stakeholders, a structured approach to how you actually make the changes, but you've just got to keep an eye on the project the whole time. So that's my take in it anyway, Dale. But I think that you're actually touching on an issue that goes beyond implementation of EV, yeah. which is something that all projects should have in place in any case. No, absolutely. It's it's, it, And as we know, we, we're actually kind of getting into the realms of a, a full project control system, right, rather yeah. than just earn value. But yeah. it does it does all tie into each other, as we've previously spoken, you know, um, it's it's an ecosystem. Yeah. So it, it, it's about, you know, you know, there's various, we've spoken about words like mycelium and things like that. And we don't want to go back into those episodes, but it's all there for folks to listen to. Yeah. But it is quite interesting because earned value isn't something that's standalone, which is also probably another myth as well. And just on your comments there, it opened a whole bunch of other questions, but I do want to bring Val in because I know he has a few as well. Yeah, thanks, Dale. I, I did. I, I'm going to get back to, um, and I'll just comment on WBS from my perspective. I think just to finish that off, I, I think you're right. We see it as a, as a thing because it's laid out like an org chart. So when you receive it, it feels like an object. But it's not. It's a process, and it's actually a, the decomposition of scope, right? So there's there's an element of movement that comes with a work plan uh, from a WBS, and people just obviously see it as just this reference index. It almost looks like a library card index or a skeleton, and it's it's rigid in itself, and therefore it cannot be moved. But it can actually be moved. The problem yeah. is, is we don't we make changes too late in the piece, and it's always an afterthought when we want to change. And once you've started a project, particularly you know, those critical path method type style projects, the big heavy ones, it's very hard to change structures. You can change content, uh, but it's very hard to change structures. So the change management thing is absolutely 100% I agree with. I'm going to go to Richard. I'm just going to switch gears. And this is probably to do with myth busters, but benefits. So one of them will be, what is the benefit? The so what big deal. Okay. So I get, I get, schedule variance, cost variance, TCPI. I get all these fancy words that they throw at me, Richard, but is it really going to make my project finish on time and on budget? And obviously, I mean, I'm being a little bit um, um, difficult there, but what's your perspective on that? I think, yeah. So my perspective is it is an extra reporting tool in your armory. So it's not just enough to say, well, we've done 22% um, of the project. It, it allows you at a glance to be able to say with a reasonable level of certainty, whether you're ahead or behind schedule, whether you're ahead or behind on your cost, and if you can recover. And I think in the, in the space of three or four or five different measurements, that's a powerful message to be able to give in a project because most project directors simply want to know, how am I doing? Mm. And with you know, four or five fairly straightforward measurements that you can put up, you say, right, this TCPI, this CPI measurement, this tells us, that we can either recover or we can't recover. So I think it's something that's basically, as I mentioned earlier on, it adds depth to your reports. And it's, it allows you to be able to sort of, you know, anticipate problems because do you know what? You want to anticipate problems early, not when they've already happened. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key selling point that I would make on in terms of those measurements. Are there any, um, because I know there's a lot of institutes out there kind of pushing not just earn value, but all sorts of modalities for project controls and project management to be a good one or best practice or whatever they want to say. Are there any like uh, doc documented benefits as in, you know, if you do it this way, you will get X, Y, Z, like deterministic, or is it still, it's, I mean, there's a lot of factors to take into account, but do we see more success in projects that do apply earn value versus projects that don't? Do we have numbers on that? Do you know? 
Off the top of my head, God, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I, I can't say right now. Um, I know that there are certainly big examples out there in, in, in major defense projects in the United States that show how they've um, achieved you know, their um, spends and all of that. I think also in terms of, like for instance, on Thameslink, um, we delivered exactly on time. We weren't late. Um, we, you know, I remember being at one of the very early planning uh, meetings back in around about, must have been about 2010, where they'd actually set out the timescale for their phase one and phase two deliveries, and they met those. So, mm. but I mean, we did use EB right the way through on, on Tenslink. It was at the very heart of all the project reporting. And, you know, so I'm just going on my own personal experience. Um, yeah. But as I say out there, there is a lot of stuff from the US DOD where they actually put out free information for you. You just have to Google it. Mm. Let's talk to uh, Martin Paverdale, see if we can get some freedom of information <laughs> for this type of data. Because yeah. it is interesting, right? Is there a correlation between certain styles or methodologies and the success output of the project? I think there must be something to that. Um, but also go to, and I'm, I'm shout out to a few people as well, where we're going along. We, we do this all the time. But uh, the... The free resource I wanted to give away was something that I learned when I was in defense uh, under the Australian standards 4817. They also have this supplement, which is what they referred to as the earned value gold card. Richard, do you remember this? I don't know if you saw this. It had all the formulas. It was like a cheat sheet for anyone who wanted to get into earned value. And for whatever reason, you know, I guess because it's defense, they love having their acronyms. So they had acronyms for everything. Uh, you had ACWP, BCWS, AC, you know, so it actually helped you kind of transfer or at least translate some of that that language um so if anyone's look, looking to go into earn value or think about earn value and rich has inspired you today i would suggest using that as a bit of a uh, uh a starter um now i'm going to flick over before and they'll shut me up if you want me to slow down but i think the future is really important and we talked about you know the appetite for earn value on future projects is that still a thing do we see a merger between what we call model or visual based planning or visualizations. We're seeing a lot more in terms of the data and technology space. Where does earn value from your, where would you like to see earn value, Richard, in that kind of future space? I, in the BIM, you know, we talk about all this um, very kind of almost virtual reality or augmented reality happening. Mm. It's, it's all, it's all very visual, but I haven't really seen how earn value would click into that. Is there, is there a mechanism for that yet? I'm not sure. Um, I certainly think that, you know, in terms of basic forecasting, it's it's something that, you know, should be really just in there as a, as a standard measure. I mean, we've used graphs in the past, you know, to sort of measure, you know, the trends on EV going forward and things like that in reporting. But I think it's, again, it's a simple, I've got a pretty simple message. It's simply like you're, you're, you're measuring what you're doing, you're forecasting when you're going to finish it, and you've got a way of showing whether you can recover or not so you know beyond that anything that you want to put out in terms of measuring and reporting it's none of it none of it's particularly difficult yeah we, we spoke to uh, dan patterson not too long ago and we'll we, i guess we're referring more back to reference class forecasting which is kind of what earn value do, does right if you if you get geeky and we get super geeky it does take some of the past and, and does some basic arithmetic to come up with some projected predictions of the future right it, it, and that's based on some variables right it doesn't take into account all the factors but in the vacuum of earned value space it will come up with some two complete performance indices and i think reference class forecasting and earned value seem to have that similar approach to um trying to figure out where we're going to land right because after all that's what the pm wants to know <laughs> how how far away am i from the actual goal am i going to spend a lot of, do i need to spend a lot of money to recover um, are we going to hit day one in terms of operations um, or do I have to have a difficult conversation with my boss or the client? And that's, that's really the, the modality of having earned value is another, as you said, tool set or kit um, to, to play with and, and have some versatility in terms of insights. Um, Richard, it's great. I, I know you've got a few myths yourself, but have we covered all your myths or do you have more in your sleeves that you would like to share with us that you think we have to get these out because people need to listen? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, if I, if, I, if I come away with one very simple message is that all you're doing is you're measuring, you're reporting, and you're forecasting. And, you know, you, you just simply want an easy way of presenting that information. And it ain't difficult. 
And I think that's really the key message. It ain't difficult. Um, and if you, you know, that would be, I suppose, the one takeaway I would like out of this conversation we, we've had today on this. And beyond that, it's scalable, totally scalable. And it's, it's not just for the big, you know, we're not building missiles. We might be just building, you know, a, um, a, a, a simple wall or a building or anything like that. It's something that's scalable and it's, and it's easy to use. That's you make key. it sound, you make it sound so easy, Richard. You make it sound so easy with someone with your skills and experience, but I'm sure, you know, with a little curiosity and a little bit of sponsorship, I think a lot of people can try this. And as you said, you don't need all the big toys or tools. You can you can do this in Excel. Is that right? Correct. Absolutely. Okay. Correct. I'll hand off to Dale now. You. I love it. I I don't want to end the myth just there yet because I want to throw in a few as well. Um, <laughs> I've also heard you know sort of earn value needs sort of some specialist person you know like a scientist because you know it's it's too difficult to explain or you know to understand the dark arts of earned value which isn't entirely true to be honest um we have as you were sort of alluding to i think well machines that can do these things for us and you know um with that i think bringing in things like you know the i guess the ais of the world and the 4ds and and all that kind of a thing and you know i've, I've seen some recent uh, software where you know especially in the built environment the physical environment where i guess uh, they're sending out engineers with you know um gopros on their hard hats to collect images and so all that is is all that that could all be automated and give you the, your physical process um, updates faster and quicker right and so you could actually get EV on the go. It doesn't have to wait for your monthly reporting cycle. You can automate those calculations. You don't need a scientist to come up with all of the formulas. It, it can actually go as far as even provide you, if you link your, your scope correctly with your WBS, I would say it can even go as far as tell, give you a variance analysis. Mm -hmm. So your X amount value late, and these are your key drivers and you why, you know, over cost or under cost, and this is where you're spending your money. Now, it might not give you the decision, right? It might not be prescriptive, but at least can tell you where to look. So you don't need all, it, it, it's not a, a huge, huge um, dark art, so to speak. It isn't, so and you've really hit the nail on the head there, Dale. The difficult part of EV is assessing the progress. It's not about the planners and the cost managers, it's assessing the progress. If you've got a message, like you've just mentioned there, where you could actually assess the progress in a completely objective manner. That's half the battle. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Because, actually, yeah. Sorry, I was I'll just going to say, jump Val, in there. Yeah, you go. I was going to say that the, the biggest debate often is what is the earned value, the BCWP, mm. right? Yeah. Why is it that value? What is the percent complete? And, and once you get beyond that, the rest actually makes sense. Sorry, I'll jump in there. No, no, 100%. You just got me thinking because I was in the future again, as you know. And Richard, I was thinking, I was just, I'm doing some work with digital engineering. I was thinking about the digital or the digital twin and how that's actually part of the asset life cycle, right? So it's a digital representation of the physical environment or the built environment. You could actually, you could leverage that digital you know, interaction and measure that as your progress claim. And I love the idea of EV on the go. So that's patent pending, right, Dale? We've, we've got that now between the three of us. Exactly. But that, that's that's exactly right. I think progress is the key to that whole triangle, right? I think if there is any variable, it's actually, or the one that you really care about, it's progress, right? If that changes, then it affects time and cost. For sure. Um, if if it's on track, then you can worry less about the rest of them. Uh, so I think we, uh, we, we've we definitely busted some of the myths around that, but it's great to know that um, it could be used in the future and with future applications. Yeah, absolutely. There's no reason why. It, actually, the future, the technology we have should actually enhance it and make it better, quicker, faster, and easier. Even things like um, we talk about change control and everything else around it, technology should all help all of this. But when it comes to earned value, it, and I, I loved your very simple sort of takeaway there, Richard, but I often just say, you know, earned value management is doing what project management should be doing. And all it is, is it's, it's a measure of performance. Correct. It's a measure of performance and that's all it is. There's, there's nothing more complicated than that to it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting because 
even though we'll give everyone or a lot of people reasons as to why earned value can work and should work, you'll probably still get those that say it won't. And I guess it's like any good methodology, you always get those that sort of love it and those that hate it. Maybe uh, I think earned value is a little bit like Marmite, right? Um, but I think the point being is, or Vegemite as you have down in Australia. Thank Bell. you, thank you very much, yes. Um, but I, I guess it's whether or not you have that Marmite or Vegemite on toast or some cracker bread or whatever it is, it's, it's how you actually serve it that might make it a little bit more palatable. And hopefully that's what this episode has done. Um, but before we go down any other uh, myths or rabbit holes, was there anything else, Richard, that you wanted to bring up around earned value management before we, we, we tie up the topic? I think, you know, one, one of the um, great times that I had on Thameslink, and this is exactly where, you know, earned value in real time uh, was every Christmas we did a major possession of the railway. And as one of the planners and project controls people out there, um, we did our time over Christmas periods and we'd be in the project war room updating our programs in real time. And actually we had a bank of cameras out there and I worked with a fantastic guy who was you know, a great mentor to me, a chap called Dave Higginson. And Dave was one of the joint project, uh, one of the joint um, managing directors of a company called Project Leaders that I worked with for many happy years with. And Higgy was one of these larger than life kind of characters. Um, he was one of these guys who literally, as you, you'd hear him coming halfway down the corridor kind of thing, but he would sit at the bank of um, monitors. And one of the comments he made, this is about 3.30 a.m. on Christmas morning. Jumping Jehoshaphat Logie, we've got we've got a we've got a complete measure now. It's all done. You can measure this and completely measure the whole thing now, Logie. And what it was was that we were able to actually update our project plans because we had literally done to hour by hour plans, but we we're also updating the main schedule for the EV side of things um, in in literally in real time as well. And Higgy was great guy to work with sadly he passed away last year but what he taught me and you can always teach old dogs new tricks he taught me that what you, you know about getting the information right bang on time and getting it out you know in a very orderly manner as as soon as you possibly can and i think a lot of people in the rail industry have, have worked with dave higginson and know and loved him very much you know because he was a, a guy who really cut through a lot of the, um, you know, make, you know he, he, he basically his his motto was to look. It's measurable. Measure it. Don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Just crack on and, and do it. So yeah, somebody I have a huge amount of admiration for as well. But um, he would definitely he was very much you know measured himself on EV. He says right, our CPI is one today, and it's not going to shift from that now, lads. Yeah, that's how he presented it. And um, he, he was a great guy to work with. Inspirational, actually. Wow. Wow. That's a fantastic tribute to Higgy. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and and it's great to share stories and anecdotes like that, We you know, um, because yeah. that that's actually what brings it to life and makes it real. Yeah. Uh, before we head towards the end of the pod, Richard, we do have a couple of features. And uh, I'd like to throw some at you. A bit of fun at the end. Um but the first feature is called Defend the Indefensible. <laughs> now, you may have heard of this before. You probably have. You definitely have. Yeah. Um, but it's a bit of fun. For 30 seconds, you have to defend a ridiculous statement that we often hear from various stakeholders. So if you are ready, I will throw your statement to defend. And remember, you have to argue for the yeah. statement. So the statement is, earned value management is a waste of time. Earned value management is, it's a waste of time simply because we have to sit there and actually analyze the project and understand the progress when all we really want to do is to just tell you it's all done and hide any problems in advance. So, you know, as far as we're concerned, that's the, you know, that's, that's, that's dark art stuff. You know, we, we don't want to have to justify the fact that we've only pulled this progress figure out of our hats. 
<laughs> and you know what we want to be able to do is come back to you in six months and say sorry lads the project is completely unprogressable and we're going to be late for the next two years no we didn't see it coming fantastic and done in an authentic irish accent as well ladies and gentlemen well done. thanks richard one more before yeah. we let you go it's fiverr it's called fiverr it's a, a quick pop quiz and it's all about yourself so quick uh, five uh quick fire questions uh all about you Question right. one, early mornings or late nights? Late nights. Question two, what are your three must-have behaviors you look for in successful project teams? Positivity, cooperation, and humor. Humor, I love that, that last bit. I think Val's nodding there violently as well. He loves a bit of humor, especially when things are quite serious. Yeah, Question good. three, what is the best book you've been gifted? How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I read it when I was 10. Wow. I love that book. I didn't read it when I was 10, but <laughs> that's a great book. Uh, question four. What is the biggest mistake you've made on a project? Being convinced not to use a proper planning tool by a project manager who only wanted to see everything a Microsoft project. Reduce. Oh, we'll get into that debate at some stage when we have you back, Richard. Question five. If you could choose one person to be stuck in a lift with, who would it be? Well, how would pair of you now? Yeah, the, apart from us, you know, I mean, I know you'd love, but oh no, only one person. So it could be Val or I. All right, right, right. <laughs> alive or dead? Uh, that's totally up to you. But they want to be alive if I'm stuck in the lift with them, otherwise it might smell. Um, <laughs> Steve Wake. Wow. He's somebody I really admire. Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> we won't tell Steve at all. Steve, if you're listening, Richard said. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, Richard. It's been great to have you on the podcast and thanks for sharing your thoughts. Like I say, you've opened quite a few other rabbit holes. We didn't go down and we will get you back to explore those. But before we let you go, what are your final thoughts you want to leave our listeners with? I think, you know, if you ask me for something like an elevator pitch, let's say, for argument's sake, uh, I think the key uh, things you want in a project is you want to be able to work out, are you in trouble? Are you going to deliver on time? How much have you spent? And how much are you going to spend? Then that's why you want to have EV on your project. And you're forecasting you're in trouble a lot sooner than you think you're going to. There we go, folks. A great way to summarize the podcast. Thanks, Richard. Val, any final thoughts from you? No, thanks, Richard, for, for illuminating a few people out there on earned value. And obviously, I'm a supporter of it. I think it's, uh, and I love your message. Really, what I got out of that was keep it simple. It can apply to any project. Um, and it's effective in, in helping project managers. Really, it's an extra part of their toolkit. So thanks for your time today. Really appreciate Excellent. it. Thanks, guys. Been a pleasure. Thanks all. That's all the time we have, folks. If you like what you've heard, remember you can pay it forward by sharing a link to this episode on your social media. A massive thank you once again to our guest today, Richard Logue, and thank you all for listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive, and have fun doing it. From me and Val, it's bye for now.